morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, this morning's uh, class here at Oasis. Um, we are so pleased that um, Dr. Bill Shuttleworth and Dr. Jazz Knopel agreed to return to do this same lecture again. Uh, the first time it happened, we had a huge waiting list, and so they were nice enough to agree to um, come back. Um, I'm Kathleen Raskob, Executive Director here at OASIS. So Dr. Bill Shuttleworth is a Regents Professor in the University of New Mexico's Department of Neurosciences and Director of UNM's Brain and Behavioral Health Institute. In addition, he is the Associate Director of the Clinical and Translational Science Center at UNM's Health Science Center. Dr. Janice Knofel is a neurologist and geriatrician in UNM's Department of Neurology and has more than 35 years of experience in the field. She has participated in clinical care, teaching, and research at UNM, and is especially interested in prevention efforts in neurological diseases of aging. Please welcome Dr. Shuttleworth and Dr. Knopfel. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so on behalf of Janice and I, thank you very much for uh, giving us this opportunity because this is a real delight for us. We were thrilled to be asked back. So thank you very much, Kathleen, for that. I was teaching medical students this morning and that was fun, but it's different because uh, you actually chose to be here. <laughs> so thank you for your interest. And, and this is something we really enjoy, which is to discuss some of the things we do and think about in terms of how brain works and what that means in everyday life. So straight off the bat, I'm not a neurologist, I don't treat patients, and I don't, um, I don't know, work with, and I can't answer some of the questions you might have about things that are going on with you and for all of us. Um, that's why it's so great to be here with Janice, because that's what Janice does. Um, so we're gonna tag team this. I will talk about things from my perspective as a neuroscientist and try to share with you what I think about looking down microscopes and talking with colleagues about what's happening in the brain, why the brain is so miraculous, and understanding the intricacies of that gives us a framework for understanding two things. One is how amazing it is that it works at all, <laughs> which really is pretty, pretty wild when you think about it. And I'll spend a little bit of time talking about really what is astonishing about the brain. And with that as a background, we'll start to talk about some of the things that might change over the course of our lives with such an intricate, beautifully controlled machine between our ears. So I will talk about the neuroscience side of things and how things are constructed and work, and then hand off back and forward with Janice to, talk, to hear from Janice what this means in real life, what this means for you living um, with this extraordinary um, device between your ears. So I'll start by, uh, so everybody's aging, so excuse me. <laughs> I think there's an on-off switch on this too, which I'm not finding yet. I need more light. Yeah, that's right. So I'm going to need some help with this button machine here, because it, it's not, there we go. So I'm going to take you inside the brain. Many of us are very familiar with what the brain looks like on the outside of that first slide, where we know basically the architecture of brain. We know, so if, the, if you're thinking about it in an analogy of looking at the globe, you know where the general countries are. We know there's parts of our brain that are involved in vision at the back, motor control, how our muscles move in the middle, and at the front, executive control, making decisions about, about how the world works. But what I want to do is take you inside and look inside the brain to see what makes up all of this function. If you zoom right in to the cellular level to look down the microscope in the brain, you find the individual building block of brain, which is a single nerve cell. This is very small. It's about a few tenths of a uh, micron, a few tenths of a... I got distracted by an Australian flag on somebody's shirt that just walked in. <laughs> I made that shirt. So uh, a few tenths of a, a, a micro, a tens of microns across, so that's uh, millionths of a meter. 
So it's pretty short, a few hundred microns long. That's the individual building block of brain. This is a schematic diagram of one of those individual brain cells. And it shows basically what they do. What they are are information trans collection and transmission um, devices. Along this end, there are a set of processes which stick out into the air and act like antennae to pick up information from other brain cells. So these are called dendrites. That's the fancy name for them, but these are the processes that pick up information. These devices actually do some computation. They act like little computers to assess this information <laughs> and then integrate all of this and then send out an appropriate response. That response goes down this long wire, which is called an axon, but it's basically the wire, the output of this brain cell. This is absolutely not drawn to scale. <laughs> <laughs> On two levels, right? So this is meant to be, this is, this is down a microscope. But also, this is not to scale to this. So some of the axons in your body are really long. This might be a few microns tiny, absolutely tiny, but this might stretch all the way down from your brain, all the way down to your big toe. One long wire to control the functions of your big toe. So this is absolutely not to scale. But the important thing is, at the end of this wire, this output processes, these terminals talk to other brain cells or things that you're trying to control, like your big toe. And there's also this computation that happens at the end here. So there's a little bit of computation here, integration, transfer of information, then computation at the end. You have a lot of these. Feels it, it feels like it. <laughs> so any guesses as to how many of these you have in your brain? 86 billion. 86 billion is a beautiful uh, answer. So the, so the answer used to be an estimated about 100 billion. It got revised down recently to about 86 billion of these individual nerve cells. Now, think about this in terms of little computers. To do all of this work, to take this information and then work with it and spit out the right answer, if you try to model that, to mimic that with a computer, it would take the equivalent of an entire brand new high powered computer to mimic the actions of this for a few milliseconds, if you want to model that. Okay, now think about the numbers now. 86 billion little laptops in a stack. <laughs> That's pretty extraordinary computational power if you think about it in those terms. So 100 billion is a rough estimate. That makes it easy to calculate some numbers for the next few minutes. But 86 to 100 billion is about average for an adult human. They all look a little bit different, but they're all um, they're doing different things to different parts of your body and brain. And they're all connected together. They're all connected together. They're not just 100 billion independent laptops, but think about them working together. They're connected at their outputs through these processes called synapse. That's from Greek, but just means connection. So you have a lot of connections between individual brain cells. This is important to think about today because one of the themes of this discussion is the brain is in your control to change. The brain is always changing. And so a lot of what's changing is changing at these connections between brain cells. So if there's 100 billion neurons, I'm here to tell you that there is about 10,000 times the number of connections <laughs> between brain cells. So each individual brain cell, here's a picture of one brain cell, and all of these little dots are other brain cells connected to it and talking to it. So it's connected to about 10,000 other little computers. So as a neuroscientist, you start to get goosebumps thinking about what this thing is doing. If you go further with the numbers, I won't go too far with the numbers because they do get 
a little bit mind boggling. <laughs> the number of combinations of connections gets astronomical because that number is actually uh, incorrect. It's, it's actually uh, orders of magnitude higher than that. So to know, if you imagine, if you've got 10 to the 15, 10, one, 10 with 15 zeros behind it, numbers of individual connections in the brain, and you ask, well, how can I, what information can I encode in this? You say, well, if I had this connection turned on and all these others turned off, that would be one possible combination. Or these two turned off and the others turned on. And you count those all up. The number of possible combinations, if you remember anything from high school math, which I don't, but I looked it up, <laughs> it's, um, it's 10 to the 15 factorial. That's 10 to the 15 with an exclamation mark next to it. You can't compute that number on any computer. You break the computer. <laughs> The number of possible combinations is more than there are particles, not just on the earth, but in the entire universe, particles in the entire universe. So that's not actually how the brain encodes information. It's a little different from that, but, it, but that just shows you the capacity of all of our brains compared to things that we know about, which is computers. <laughs> So this means that the amount of information that is moving around your brain is really astronomical. And the amount of, and the speed at which that can occur is faster the, for the, if you're dealing with the amount of information transfer is faster than the best supercomputer that man has made. So this is this is the Sequoia, the IBM Sequoia supercomputer, which until I, I think three years ago was the fastest supercomputer on the planet. And this supercomputer will knock your socks off, will beat you obviously extremely well in any race to calculate the digits of pi or to calculate anything question that you ask it, because it can calculate those things very, very well. But what it can't do is what your brain does which has moved massive amounts of information between parts of the brain all the time. So a group of investigators at MIT tested this and they did a head-to-head -head comparison with information transfer, not on this guy, but someone <laughs> like him, and said how much information gets transferred and how fast. And the human brain right now is about 30 times faster in terms of information transfer than the Sequoia supercomputer. You can power this on a hamburger. This requires this person's brain can be had, or a tofu salad, let's say. But this requires a small power plant to operate. <laughs> so that fact alone lets us start thinking about one piece of the neurobiology of aging. And that is, this is an enormously energetically demanding organ. If you imagine a whole stack of little computers, you need to keep them running. The same happens in your body. You need to send an awful lot of energy to each one of these brain cells so that it can fire all of these electrical events and do all this computation. Your brain, for most of us, is just a few percent of our body weight, maybe 20% of our body weight. It's a few pounds, maybe two pounds average. But it uses a disproportionately large amount of energy. I think I've got my mouth wrong. A few percent of weight and about 20% of the... There you go. You're dealing with some very skinny people. A few percent of body weight, 20% of the um, energy consumption is by your brain. And all of that fuel, that oxygen and sugar that comes to support all those little computers is fed to it by the vasculature, the blood vessels of your brain. So if you're thinking about extraordinary computational power <laughs> supplied to individual brain cells, there's a very, very rich innovation, a very rich vascular supply, supply of blood vessels, so that each brain cell is no more than 30 or 40 microns away from a blood vessel. That lets these little machines work well. If there's any disruption or um, weakening of the vascular supply to the brain as occurs to all of us as we age. That's really important to think about for maintaining healthy function of all these little computers. 
So rule number one, from a neurobiologist standpoint for, for healthy brain aging, is to make sure that you're keeping the good times rolling by keeping blood and oxygen and sugar going to all these little computers. So that means maintaining your vascular health, <coughs> maintaining uh, with exercise and appropriate diet, low blood pressure so you're not weakening these vessels, good supply and no hardening of arteries to make sure that you're able to keep this most intricate of organs well supplied with the fuel that it needs. So every time you read about diet and exercise, good for your heart and everything else, that's fine. But from a neuroscientist's point of view, the heart's pretty simple. You can get in there and write a root of that. This is incredibly intricate. We don't run catheters up to here generally and, and clear out little vessels, supply a little patch that's involved in cognition or something. It's up to you. It's up to you to keep these vessels shiny and healthy as long as you can, as good as you can. So the second point that I want to raise to set this th is to set this up is to think about why we have all this information processing. Why do we have something that's better than a supercomputer in terms of sending information around the brain? One way to do that is to think about what your brain does, and it's easy to forget what you're doing all the time. One example I use with uh, students is sometimes this uh, soccer player about to kick a soccer ball. You could replace this whole analogy I'm going to use with tipping a cup of coffee, tipping a, a, a coffee pot to accurately pour a cup of coffee. To say everything I'm going to talk about with kicking a soccer ball happens in our daily lives as well. But I like this because of the, um, the team that this guy plays for. Do you know this? what country this is? Australia. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're a much better group than last time. We have, we have an Australian flag, we have someone who knows the soccer roots. Um, so this guy's about to kick a soccer ball. And what I want to do is just to think broadly about all the stuff that's happening with information processing. If you think about what's happening here in the brain, there's a lot going on in different parts of the brain that need to talk to each other. For a start, at the back of the brain, something simple as vision, he's looking to see where he needs to kick the ball. That involves millions, tens of millions of neurons at the back of his brain so that he can see. What he's seeing is better than the best 3D motion stabilized um, TV cameras that we have. It's stereo vision, it's full color, it refreshes much faster than standard TV. And as he's moving up and down, the brain is correcting for that movement, giving you a perfectly stable image. How good is that? <laughs> That's being coordinated uh, with body movement through the cerebellum, this part of the brain at the bottom, which is keeping him perfectly balanced or keeping you perfectly balanced, pouring a cup of coffee. That's making adjustments all over your body within milliseconds to make sure it's all smooth and groovy. I'll stop using groovy. I'm talking to an older audience. <laughs> Actually, maybe groovy's better. <laughs> okay. Cool. Yeah, it's cool. <laughs> so just to give you an example, there's a lot of other things going on that you might not even think about. So brainstem, this, this stalk on which the, the brain is held, that's controlling a lot of the body functions to match with what it needs at that moment. So heart rate, blood pressure, um, and everything else that's going on is controlled by parts of the brainstem. Again, millions of neurons doing their thing. Absolutely the right time, the right place for this. Things as important as um, at the front of the brain, where you make decisions, executive control, might be integrated with memories deep in the brain or distributed in the top of the brain about the particular goalie that's here today. It might be, you might be recalling what you read in the newspaper three weeks ago that this goalie had an injury on the left and you might be thinking, not even thinking, but subconsciously aware that you should kick to the right. Now, all of that is happening within milliseconds and that's all happening on the go between different parts of the brain. Something that a supercomputer currently does not do very well. So that analogy is meant to make us think about why and how this intricate machine works 
and what's going on during aging that we need to pay attention to. So what Janice and I are going to do is try to talk a little bit about some things that are common perceptions and misperceptions perhaps about the brain, just to bring this to, to connect this to how we usually think about brain without being in a laboratory or a lab. So what we often hear is our statements like this, you only use 10% of your brain. Myth or fact? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it'd be pretty silly if I put this up as a fact, yeah. um, the way I framed this. But yeah, it's an absolute myth, but it's a very common one. You know plenty of people that seem to be only using 10% of their yeah. <laughs> So it's a very reasonable starting point. But the brain, again, is very energetically demanding. So nowhere else in your body do you pump huge amounts of resources, huge amounts of energy for stuff that's not doing anything. The brain throughout our lives constantly monitors what's going on. And if something is not being used, it's gotten rid of. It's assigned to other duties. We do not have billions of brain cells lying on deck chairs waiting for their day to work. <laughs> it would require an enormous amount of energy be very inefficient biologically for a whole bunch of reasons. So you can now see with non-invasive brain imaging evidence that the brain is always working, that no parts of the brain are just slacking off. And within an individual region of the brain, what the brain does is uses everything it has and maximizes efficiency all the time. This is a classic example from 2001 was one of the early studies looking at the resting state of the brain. So that's a state where people thought the brain shut off. You're not doing anything, you're not thinking about anything, you're just lying in an MRI scanner. Well, guess what? Your brain is incredibly active. And these images show blood flow at different, this is uh, during a visual stimulus. So there's a brain responding to a visual stimulus with the visual cortex, the back of the brain, lighting up with increased blood flow as somebody attends to an image. This is slightly different scale, but this is all of the brain being active when they're being asked not to look at something. The brain says, thank goodness, I don't have to do that. Now I can do what I really need to do, not what you told me to do, and that's take care of all this other stuff that I need to be processing to maintain your brain um, in good health. So the brain is always active and um, not 90% hanging out, waiting for things to do. So with that basic setup of um, <coughs> brain biology, I'll hand across to Dr. Nofel uh, to tell you what this means. <laughs> so I've been told I have to stand here. Is, is the mic on? <coughs> now it's on. Wonderful, thank you. Um, if there's a problem with you hearing me, let, let me know, just wave and I'll uh, increase. Okay, so. Um, I'm going to try to translate that to, uh, to us and how we function and what this really means for us. So the question is, so if we're only using 10% of our brain, what's the other 90% doing? As Dr. Shuttleworth has said, it's there for a reason, for a purpose. So what, what is it doing? So I'm going to ask you these questions. So the other 90% is already used up with our prior education and um, work life. Is it busy keeping things running while we're, while we're not thinking about things? Is it waiting to be used? It's on call, if you will. Will it never be used? Is it just there in case something happens, some brain damage happens, happens and maybe it'll step in? Um, has, has it, it will, will never be used, has never been used. You know, we probably know some younger people who's, think the brain's never been used. Um, and then the last question is, does it really help to keep our head balanced? Is that what the brain is really for? So translation to real life. Um, so if we think we are only using 10% of the brain, this is what the other 90% is doing. It's already used up? No, it's not already used up. It might be preoccupied perhaps with memory. That's where, I mean, we do store all of our memories in our brain. So, but those memories are on call, ready to be uh, utilized again, to, to be remembered. Um, is the brain busy keeping things running? You bet. So all the things we take for granted, 
like, I mean, who's controlling their heart rate right now? Well, I'm not consciously controlling it. My brain is. And who's, who's monitoring our oxygen level so you know to take another breath of air? The brain is, but we're not consciously doing that. But the brain is doing that for us, fortunately. It's also helping us monitor our temperature, right? This is a pretty nice, comfortable room, uh, but we would be uncomfortable if it were either um, hotter or cooler. Okay, so the brain is also doing that. So those are just some examples of what the brain is doing for us that we're not even conscious of. Um, is it waiting to be used? Well, it's waiting to be activated. So it is indeed, it is on standby. So it's going to be awake and ready for action when you purposefully call it into um, action. Uh, will it never be used? Well, it's being used for something already. It may be used for something new in the future if you undertake uh, uh, additional uh, acquisition of knowledge or practice of habits or skills. Um, has never been used? Well, as Dr. Shuttleworth has says, had says, if it's not been used before and it's not doing any of those other functions, it's already gone. The brain will not support, uh, if you will, a fallow field. It's, it's not going to be um, available if it's not being used. And it helps to balance our head? No, that's what our neck and body are for. So I wanted to also give you, uh, again, a few, a few images, because these, these are what we call clinical images. So these are images that we use in the clinical setting when we're trying to uh, figure out what is going on with, um, with people and difficulties with symptoms in their brain. So I'm going to focus on these two, the middle two, if you will. So uh, Dr. Shuttleworth um, showed us some images of blood flow to the brain. And this is, it's, it's, it's similar, but it's different, if you will. This is showing actual utilization of sugar, of glucose, which is the fuel of the brain cells. And it's really the only fuel of the brain cells. So we can image the use of glucose in our brain and um, understand what areas are uh, being uh, very active during certain tasks. It's been very instructive, and that's uh, how, how we have moved forward uh, neuroscience in this area by these kind of techniques. Um, so this is the uh, sugar scan, the, the glucose scan, if you will, and what we do is that we superimpose this scan upon a structural scan. So this is, again, then this is, this is an MRI, you've heard of that, I'm sure. So this actually tells us what the brain substance looks like, but it doesn't tell us how it's functioning. It doesn't tell, it, tell us how it's acting. This, we need the metabolic scan to do that. So um, as we learn new skills, our brain is learning by trial and error about what we, uh, what we want to do. Uh, initially, when we are learning a new task, and I, I have to say, I've said this before to this group, you know, the reason I go to church is to watch the little kids <laughs> because they are being confined in a space and time that they, I think a lot of them would rather be exploring other things. So to watch them do certain things uh, to me is very instructive um, to understand how the brain works and how the brain develops because they're, they're learning in action right there before our very eyes. So initially when uh, somebody, a, a child is learning a new skill, the whole brain practically is activated, trying to figure out how, how am I going to do something? How am I going to do this? And so the whole brain is activated, but as the individual starts to discover how to do something well, for instance, walk or sit up or talk, certain parts of the brain become more highly specialized and the activity of the brain then becomes more restricted to those areas that, um, the, again, from how the brain has worked out. Well, this is the part of the brain that controls that particular function. So over time, uh, the activation of the brain uh, really becomes much more specialized. So an example of this is what I go to church to watch. Intention to move, vision and hearing, a movement of the arms, trunk, and legs in relationship to space, um, balance and upright and moving position, 
uh, screening out distractions, and I've got some good examples of that, and then finally reaching the target. So these are some of the activities that we can see in action when we watch our children and grandchildren. So how this shows up in uh, scanning, again, Dr. Shuttleworth has seen, uh, we've seen some of this with him. So this is an example of a visual task. And this, again, this is the, uh, this is the glucose scan. So this area uh, in the back of the brain is what we call the occipital visual cortex is lighting up. And this is it from three different slices. So that's, so red, red is like really hot, really active. So that's, that's where the action is. Um, sensory motor are uh, closely associated with each other. You know, the sensory and the motor, they're, they're integrated uh, very uh, strongly. And so this is the area of the brain that is involved with moving of our limbs, of our trunk, our head, our, our speech, comes out in speech. Uh, the basal ganglia is deep inside the brain. So, so this part of the, the cortex of the brain kind of is responsible for um, helping us understand what we want to do and how we're going to plan to do it. But then those uh, signals come down to the deep part of the brain where it actually happens. Um, and uh, Dr. Shuttleworth talked about the default mode and that's, that's what the bottom is. So as we learn new skills, and this is not just restricted to babies and children in church, it's, it's applies to all of us, um, our brain becomes more and more efficient at that skill. And what do we call that? We call that practice. That's the practice effect. Uh, initially large, then smaller and smaller portions of the brain are activated. As we learn and practice, for, as we learn and practice brain centers become specialized. That's why our vision is in the back of the brain, it's specialized. It becomes more efficient, so it doesn't take all of our brain energy and consciousness to do that skill. It becomes secondhand, it becomes well-learned. And um, over time, that area becomes more uh, connected to other specialized centers. And, and overall, as time goes by and we get better and better at something, we need less brain power to do that. And I'm going to give some, some good examples. Again, this is why I go to church to watch children learn how to walk. So we have a, an infant who is uh, crawling, but he's trying to do something a little more than that, isn't he? Trying to get up on those legs. And eventually he will figure out moving is easier on two limbs than on four because then you get to do things with your hands and your arms. Um, but I have to figure out how to do that. And then you've got this whole thing called balance. How do you manage that? Okay, that's another part of the brain. And then finally, success. We have success, and this is probably over the space maybe of, oh, I don't know, two or three months maybe. This, this uh, child is making uh, progress. But then from this to this, so that's probably maybe only six months, but it's that practice effect. And we all know that babies and infants are practicing all the time, although we don't call it that, right? We call it learning and development. So this, this child, I don't know, is that she's, she's maybe two years old, maybe? Maybe, okay. So fast forward about uh, maybe 16 or 18 years, and we've got this. How did that happen? So again, with practice and specialization and training and thought, we become highly, highly skilled over time. Um, and this applies to not just uh, athletic endeavors, uh, physical endeavors, but also cognitive. Look, we've got the piano player. How many hours of practice did that song take, that individual? So the brain is becoming more and more efficient with practice. And of course, this is another one I like. <laughs> so you got a two-year-old who's really happy, but then you've got these race car drivers who are really happy too. Okay. So it's the same skill, right? But highly specialized and highly practiced. So that's what uh, the, the process is of learning and practicing. So as we learn um, new skills, our brain becomes more and more efficient at that skill, right? There's an old joke, and I tell a joke in here. So the surgeon um, comes to visit the patient who has just had an operation. And uh, so the patient asks the, 
asked the surgeon, oh, good, so, you know, the, the operation went well. Does this mean I'll be able to play the piano? And the, the surgeon says, of course you can play the piano. And the patient said, well, that's good. I never could before. <laughs> so it takes practice to do these things. So again, uh, this is a point I've made before. Activation of widespread portions of the brain becomes smaller and smaller restricted as we learn as we learn practice and perfect that particular skill. So as we need less and less uh, power, brain power to perform the skill, we become, an, we, we go on autopilot, right? Uh, riding a bicycle is autopilot. Driving is autopilot. Walking is autopilot. I think for some people talking is autopilot too. <laughs> but, um, but basically, why we have specialized centers is because then it frees up more room in the brain for new skills and new, new practice. So transition to real life. So if we are actively using only 10% of our brain, what's the other 10% doing? Keeping things running, yes. Waiting to be used, yes. Already used up, no. Red, already too full, no. Our brain is never too full. So. The brain is just waiting for more things to learn, practice, and perfect. So tips for utilizing more brain. So how do we do that? We've already learned how to walk and drive and talk. So what, what else is left, right? Well, we have to understand what, what kind of new skills we're interested in. You know, are we going to be able to dedicate enough time to really acquire a new skill and to do well at that? Um, we have to extensively practice that new skill. What do they, what do they say? 10,000 hours of practice makes an expert. That's a lot of time, but yet a lot of, a lot of people do that. Uh, we have to, ex we, it's nice to experiment in new ways with that new skill. That's why I like gardening. There's always new challenges in gardening. There's always new and different ways to do things, different plants, et cetera. So taking an older skill and then experimenting with that. Um, I like this one also, establish new skills, relate, uh, new relationships related to that skill. So if you have something you're passionate about and you're really good at, well, let's not keep that wealth to yourself. Let's go out and make new, new personal relationships with our peers, uh, with our children, maybe with school children to really help to share that skill. And of course, teach the new skill. That's excellent too, isn't it? Not just to practice it and keep it to ourselves. Let's teach it and then become an expert in that new skill. So I'm going to turn it back to Dr. Shuttleworth to explore the second myth that we have. Well, that's, that's a terrific setup to this next point where we're often taught that what we just heard about, the, the growth and development of the brain as an infant is an extraordinary phase. The old view on neuroscience was you get born with a certain number of neurons, nerve cells, you get them all set up in the right way, and that's what you've got for the rest of your life. So that was the theory that the brain was pretty static once you set it up, and in some way, sort of like you're wiring up a machine and you're using a solder gun and you're soldering all these things up and making sure it all works. And then if it breaks later in life, well, that's just broken. You don't grow new stuff. So this myth has been challenged a lot in the last decade with basic neuroscience. The brain is now recognized to be a much more dynamic place than it was conceived of even 10, 20 years ago. It's continually changing through life. That means that the things that Dr. Nofel just talked about in our daily lives as we're aging, it means there's the possibility for change and you can control that. So this is the phase where you have millions of new synapses, new connections forming per second as an infant during these critical phases. But what about someone closer to our age? This, this, the numbers are smaller, but the capacity is fundamentally the same mechanisms, but to less extent. So what's changed in neuroscience is understanding that these synapses are very dynamic. They're constantly being monitored by the brain. They're not just set up and then the brain goes on and does the next bit of wiring. Throughout your lives, those connections are monitored. And if they're not good, they're gotten rid of. And you can establish new ones in their place. 
So the view that I like to think about how the brain is working from a neuroscientist perspective is that rather than being concreted in, a connection between brain cells is more like a handshake. It starts with a relationship forms and it needs to be maintained to maintain that relationship through life. So looking down the microscope, you see a collection of connections between brains, some of which are quite immature and some of which are solid and long-standing. And to me, that's a little bit like two people just starting to make contact versus an established, maintained relationship where these people keep talking to each other long enough so this relationship is maintained. So there's a saying in neuroscience that well, it's a little bit like is it or lose it. It's in neuroscience, it's neurons, nerve cells that fire together, wire together. <laughs> and that was said by a famous neuroscientist a couple of decades ago. And that's a pretty foundational principle for a lot of the experiments that are done right now to figure out how this works. The principle is if neurons and nerve cells are talking to each other, zapping at the same time, that's their handshake. And they get connected together and stay connected together as long as they keep talking to each other. The parallel, or the, the correlate, correlate of that is neurons out of sync fail to leak, which is another way of saying use it or lose it. So neurons that fire together, wire together, neurons out of sync fail to leak. So this is the new view of the brain. So this is um, an image from a neuroscience lab looking at a single brain cell at quite high resolution. So we're zoomed in looking at some of these individual synapses, connections between brain cells. We're just looking at one cell, and so tens of thousands of other cells, nerve cells that connect to this aren't seen in this picture. We've just got an indicator in one of them. This is a looping movie, so this is about half an hour of movie, a bit longer than that, you're making a liar out of me. It's about an hour of movie, let's see if it's an hour. Well, it's a bit more than an hour. <laughs> So this is a looping movie, but two, two really striking things. One is that these connections aren't done in concrete. They are moving a lot, a lot more than we thought a couple of decades ago. And they're constantly adjusting, being checked out, and adjusted to make sure they're optimal. That's pretty amazing. The other amazing thing is what's in this circle. And this circle is the birth of a new connection. So there was nothing here before, and this thing arises out of the brain cell because there's something else talking to it, it says, I want to talk to you now, let's get together. And this is a birth of a new connection. This is not restricted to an infant. This is happening to every one of us all day in everything we do. So even this discussion this morning is changing the structure of your brain. You're forming new connections if you choose to retain any of this. <laughs> that will involve things like this, the physical structure of your brain changes all the time and not just as an infant. And that's super important to think about anything to do with, with brain um, aging. It's not as easy for reasons about the chemicals of the brain. There's reasons why this is more active as an infant. You need to go from zero to 60, not using the NASCAR analogy, but zero to some big number of learning an awful lot in a short period of time as an infant. Most of that, you can learn how to breathe and walk and talk, you're gonna carry with you without changing so much throughout the rest of your life. So there's a whole bunch of stuff in the soup in your brain, the chemistry of your brain, including factors with names like BDNF and other neurotrophic factors. The names don't matter, but it's a good juice to make the brain more plastic. And that is different as we age. There's less of that juice around that makes things more dynamic, but there's still enough. There's still enough that we can learn new things and the practice might be more, practice may be required, but the same mechanisms absolutely work. That's very important to realize from a neuroscience perspective anyway. Now, what you do and how you live changes the ability of the brain to be dynamic like this. So we've talked a little bit about cardiovascular health. That's fundamental. You absolutely have to have the uh, nutrients for these machines to work. 
Dr. Nofel mentioned sugar, so don't get confused and think you just got to go out and eat donuts because the brain lives on donuts. <laughs> <laughs> From a neuroscientist's point of view, the rest of the body supports the brain. The brain doesn't support the body, obviously, from our point of view. So the rest of the body takes stuff, your GI tract takes all this complex food and turns it into sugar. So you can live on protein and still make plenty of sugar for the brain. Don't get confused about that. So and that's really important. If you want to live a long time, don't just live on donuts. The brain does an awfully good job of extracting the nutrients it needs from a good, healthy diet. And that's very important for keeping those blood vessels intact. But the other thing is how you live your life changes the ability to be dynamic in your brain. So um, this is showing changes in, in dendritic structure, in uh, control, and this is with exercise. So this is showing a brain which is not so dynamic and doesn't have so much change in its brain versus one where new connections are forming as a consequence of exercise. Exercise increases the juice that you need to be dynamic. Things like these neurotrophic factors that I mentioned, BDNF, that's one of probably many chemicals that go up when you're living an active, healthy lifestyle because your body probably thinks you're out there interacting with a complex world. We better make sure you can handle any change that you come up against. So exercise is a good fundamental trigger for cognitive flexibility. From an evolutionary standpoint, that might, might make some sense. So not just walking on a treadmill, but from a neuroscience perspective, walking in a complex world talking to interesting and different people who might disagree with you. Some of those things are important for cognitive flexibility and for creating the environment for the brain to know that it has to be able to change. The flip side of that coin is when the brain decides not to spend its resources learning new things. So stress is one of those things that you should avoid for um, cognitive flexibility and learning. These are studies taken from animals, animal studies taken from laboratories, but the same principles we expect would absolutely apply to humans. If you take nerve cells in the prefrontal cortex, the front of your brain making decisions about things, and you look at how many connections they are formed and how richly they're changing, in a control animal, there's a lot of change that happens as an animal investigates its world. If you subject that animal to chronic stress, the animal can survive. The animal shuts down and is less able to make more new connections and learn new things and interact positively with a complex world. It shuts down a little bit. So this stress changes the chemistry of the brain. It changes the ability of the brain to uh, make new connections and learn new things. Now, it's a, it's a bell curve. A little bit of stress is actually pretty good for learning things, but very in these types of experiments, too much stress changes the ability of the brain to be flexible. So those things are very encouraging for me because this is my little son. He just turned two. This is my dad who I'm rapidly catching up to proportionally in age. And so I'm very grateful that this, um, that this actually works. Well, I hope it works. <laughs> So let's explore the uh, real life ramifications of what we've just learned about learning. So um, we know that our cognitive uh, abilities change with age. Uh, hard to know exactly when they peak, probably because it's ex extremely variable. Perhaps uh, uh, some of the world's most uh, fantastic scientific discoveries have been made uh, by scientists in their 30s. But yet we know that uh, many people, most people are productive uh, way into their uh, 60s, 70s, uh, 80s, and sometimes 90s. I like to use the example of Picasso. He was still painting at his advanced age. So there are, are many human uh, qualities that do decline with age. We can't, we can't deny that. We should really embrace uh, aging, actually. So in cognitive abilities, we have changes in, mem in uh, executive function, memory, language, and visual spatial. We know uh, our, motor act our motor skills change with age. Uh, we become slower, 
uh, we're not as strong and we don't have as much flexibility. That's why most professional athletes are in their 20s and 30s and opposed to 60s and 70s. Uh, sensory, we know that peripheral uh, sensation and our special senses, hearing and vision, uh, et cetera, taste, uh, also do change with age. Uh, so we have, we have some changes, but not everything changes with age. Some things actually get better. Do you believe that? <laughs> some things actually do get better. Um, so there are some qualities that have minimal decline with age. And what are some of those? Vocabulary. We have a richness in our verbal communication that as we, as we get older, that is not there in a 20 year old, I can tell you. So vocabulary uh, increases dramatically because that's a function of our exposure to language. And we continue to be exposed to language, both with, uh, with the written print, with written and also uh, with auditory. Storytelling, that's why most of our best storytellers are older. They're not 15 year olds, right? <laughs> They're 45 and 65 year olds who have the, the wonderful narrative uh, abilities. Um, articulation does not change with age. Uh, you can still uh, form, form the words and speak as well as you could in, in younger life. Uh, simple attention, which is paying attention to one thing at a time not doing a whole lot of multitasking is helpful to uh, at, at, at attending and paying attention to certain one thing. Um, procedural memory, which is how we do things, you know, how, how do things proceed? And again, I use the example of riding a bicycle. Okay, that's procedural memory. For, for men of a certain age, changing a tire it's a procedural, some women do, mostly men, some, some women, so that once you know how to change a tire, you're going to still be able to do that for the most part. Um, learning we know does take longer as we age, but we can still learn well with age. Uh, motor, uh, the practice effect, we talked about the practice effect quite a bit in my previous presentation. Well, the practice effect does not go away because a person is no longer young. We all have that practice effect. It is lifelong, uh, our entire lives. And if we practice something long enough and hard enough and innovative enough, we are going to master that skill. So the practice effect is still there. And of course, emotion. Emotion, if anything, becomes um, more heartfelt as we age. Um, we have had more uh, human experiences, which engenders different emotions. We, as old people get older, we tend to control our emotions a little bit better, correct? Mm -hmm. And I'd like to again use, again use the story that on a Saturday night at the bars, the 80 year olds are not getting into fights. <laughs> <laughs> it's the 20 and the 30 year olds that are getting into fights because we can modulate our emotions a lot better. So I just want to introduce you to somebody that is one of my own personal heroes. I don't know, has anybody heard of this Mr. Johnny Kelly before? Yes. Um, oh, good. Excellent. So I, I lived in the Boston area before I moved to New Mexico. And here is uh, Johnny Kelly right here. And you can tell the age of this picture, not by the runner, but by uh, the bystanders. They have the old, the old time clothes on. Uh, and equipment. So he's a bot to me. He's a Boston Marathon hero. He he ran track in high school, so that 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 was his qualification. Um, he was talked into running uh, the Boston Marathon and uh, at the age of 21. And once he got back into training from his high school uh, uh, activities, he never got out of shape again. <laughs> it's it's a remarkable story. So he won the Boston Marathon in 1935 and 1945. He had, uh, was in second place seven times. He holds the record for that. Mm -hmm. He finished 15 times in the top five. He ran in 61 marathons. Now, do we have any marathon runners here in the crowd? <laughs> oh gosh, <laughs> not even one, oh dear. We'll have to change that next time. <laughs> he, he last ran, he, he last finished the Boston Marathon at age 84 and he was suffering actually from Alzheimer's disease. And that's what he ended up passing away from. But yet at the age of 97, 97. yes. 
So I, running, I don't know if it's good for your joints, but it's certainly good for longevity, I would say. <laughs> so um, yes, you, you do get slower as you age. So he did not win the Boston Marathon at age 80. He was a, young, a younger man when he, when he ran, when he won it. But I like to use this point. Mr. Kelly at age 84 would beat me in a marathon at any age. I have never run a marathon. I'm not sure I'm going to ever run a marathon. <laughs> but um, it just this is just the illustration that the motor decline is inevitable due to the aging process, yes. But most of what we attribute, much of what we attribute to old age is lack of practice for poor physical and cardiovascular conditioning and in persistence in attaining our goals. So we can do it um, if we have the motivation to do that. So this is, this is talking about motor skills. How about cognitive skills? So do they, do they persist with age as well? So I like this quote too. Old age and treachery will always beat youth and exuberance. <laughs> take, take comfort in that quote. <laughs> so um, cognitive success with age is dependent upon many things. It's dependent upon communication. And communication for the most part is, is really dependent upon a healthy brain, but also upon optimal sensory function and hearing, vision, tactile sense is very important to our ongoing communication. And a lot of times if we have impairments in hearing or in vision, it really cuts down on our ability to communicate. So we have to optimize the senses that we have uh, in order to uh, ensure or to help to stack the odds in our favor of a good um, old age, if you will. Um, executive function, which is that part of the brain, it's in the frontal part of the brain. It has to do with planning. Well, first of all, goal selection. We have to figure out what we want to do. Then we have to figure out how, how to do it. And after we do those two things, we actually have to do it. So that's all the executive function. An executive function was you reading the catalog for Oasis, choosing what you want, checking your calendar to see if you could do it, and then arriving here today on time. That is a great example of executive function. Um, implicit and procedural memory, again, how, how to do things, that's, that's the cognitive ability. That's riding a bicycle, yes, it is a physical uh, trait, physical ability, but it's also cognitive. All those things we know how to do, it's cog cognition as well. Uh, mental flexibility is needed if we're going to undertake uh, to learn new things, and we know we can learn new things, but it takes longer and it takes more persistence, but we can still do it. Uh, persistence and patience and emotional maturity uh, will aid us along the way. Again, another hero of mine, Mr. Thomas Edison. I would uh, highly recommend if you're ever in the Sarasota, Florida area to go visit his, uh, his uh, laboratory down there. It's been preserved in a museum. It's a wonderful thing. Um, at age 21, he went to work uh, selling candy on the train. I think his father was a, a conductor, as a matter of fact. So, so he liked, he needed to earn some money, but he really wanted to also do what he wanted to do. So he set up his own little chemistry lab. I can't imagine that happening today, but in those days, he did. Um, he started in the telegraph office. He graduated from selling candy on the train to the telegraph office at age 16, and he started to understand how things could be improved. He got his first patent at age 21, his last patent at age 80. So he was not a gentleman to rest on his laurels, and he generally is considered the, um, the greatest American inventor that we have yet produced. Okay, personal take-home lesson. Does anybody know this gentleman, this, this picture of this gentleman? He is advertised as the world's most interesting man. Okay, you, you don't recognize him without the beer, right? <laughs> so this is the, uh, the man's mo the world's most interesting man. So my personal take-home lesson is learning occurs every day, but it can be enhanced with focus. If you have intent and mindfulness, you can enhance your learning. Inquisitiveness is natural to all of us. It might just be hiding a little bit or hibernating, if you will. It's waiting to be woken up. Creativity and innovation is part of life and it's a part of all of us.
we don't always have to do everything the same way. I had a research colleague in Boston and we were talking about how we can do things differently. She says, well, you know, every other day I brush my teeth with my left hand. Like, oh, I never thought about doing that. But that's just an example of how we can switch things, change things up and experience new things. Uh, it takes uh, cognitive effort and purposeful intent and getting back to our world's most interesting man, his what's his motto? Stay thirsty, my friends. He wasn't talking about beer. <laughs> he was talking about our emotional and intellectual experiences to stay thirsty. And we're back to another myth. <laughs> Okay, so um, discussion about brain size is important because one of the things you might read in the newspapers is that uh, your brain gets smaller as you age, and that sounds pretty bad if we've talked about this as a, as a um, as an intricate machine that's required for life and thinking. The brain does get a little smaller in terms of weight, but in terms, what I want to tell you is in terms of effectiveness and efficiency, that can go up. So you do lo lose a little, we all lose, after, a, after we turn about 40, about 5% of the weight of your brain per decade. And some of that's a good thing. So this is a map showing what people think about most in terms of brain development. This is the other end of the spectrum. You build everything with a whole bunch of 100 billion nerve cells or 86 billion nerve cells going to the right place before birth, then connecting up mainly here before adolescence. And then the view is not, it's not true that this is um, wired statically for the rest of your life. We've talked about that already. But the question is whether the number of brain cells goes down. The original thinking was that it, if your brain gets smaller in size and weight as you age, that means you've got less brain cells. That's only a tiny piece of it. There, it's true that some brain cells are lost and not replaced. That might be those that were hanging out on a deck chair, not doing much. It could be, there's something else that's very important to think about, if your brain, if your body is not healthy and your plumbing isn't healthy, then there will be some nerve cells throughout life that won't get enough nutrients to survive. And some of those will get knocked off. And that's an important thing to pay attention to. But there's another piece of the puzzle which doesn't get as much airtime, and that's pruning. There's probably many gardeners in the audience, and you know the importance of pruning for your garden. So this is actually not a nerve cell. It looks a lot like a nerve cell. These are two trees, one of which has been pruned. This is before and after pruning. I put this picture up because it looks an awfully lot like a nerve cell. In fact, if you showed this to students in my lab, they would rush to tell you what part of the brain it was from. It actually looks a lot like that. So the complexity of a tree and the neuron is, is for the same reason. This maximizes the ability to, to put out little branches and tweaks to get the most surface area for photosynthesis as possible. That gets you the most energy into this thing. And that's what young brain cells do. They put out as many processes as they can to try and catch as much information. I want to hear everything. I want to do everything. This tree in the orchard is optimized to make fruit. It just doesn't want to have as many leaves as possible. It wants to have as many fruit-bearing branches as possible. And as our, brain, as our brains develop and mature, we don't want to hear everything. We want to increase efficiency. And so a very important part of aging well is choosing what you want to do and allowing the brain to be strengthened and more efficient at things that you choose. So the brain gets a bit smaller <laughs> because this is a child's birth, seven years of age, 15 years of age, there's a big drop in complexity. And that's viewed as thinning of the gray matter, the outside of the brain. Not because there's less brain cells, but there's a same number of cells that are doing things more efficiently. So when you read that, when you read that your brain is getting lighter and smaller, your comeback, if you're healthy, is that it's just getting better. So that's one thing to think about. The other thing to think about is a gentleman like this. Everyone knows, knows who this is. This is uh, Mr. Einstein. So he was Dr. Einstein. So he. Um, his brain wasn't the biggest brain in the world. There's been a lot of analysis of his brain. Some of it's made it into the popular press. And there's a few perhaps misconceptions about this, but one of the things is that he, had, he didn't have more brain cells. 
He actually had a lot more of these cells called astrocytes in some parts of the brain. The data's a little bit mushy, but the, the idea is that he had a very well-tuned brain to do what he wanted to do. And that's more important than having a big brain. It's about choosing the things you want to do and doing them well. So that's all I have to say on that. Um, Janice, over to you. Thank you again. Um, so again, um, a lot of the analogies I use are from early life early life examples. So we have our, um, our little ones, the baby develops. One of the things that we follow clinically in the pediatrician's office is, well, we do the height and the weight, right? But we also do the head, the head circumference. So why do we, why do, we do that? That's a critical parameter of uh, growth, of course, because head circumference itself is a proxy for the growth of the brain. Um, and that's one reason why the um, sutures in the baby is not, are, they're not formed, they're not in concrete, they are able to expand uh, quite a bit to accommodate the growth of the brain. And that occurs over approximately the first, well, the growth in the head occurs over approximately the first four years of, of life. It, um, it parallels the observed developmental milestones. So with the baby able to support the head upright, um, to be able to start to purposefully move the hands and the arms, uh, to be able to uh, visually look and respond with a smile to, uh, to a face. Uh, so the growth of the head really uh, parallels all of the developmental milestones of, of the infant. The adult brain size, uh, well, it's not, a, it's not a, a quite by age 40, by age four, but about 80% of the brain size is attained by age four. So early on, before birth, the synapse formation, the formation of the brain connections is all driven by biology. But after birth, it's driven by experience. After birth meaning, uh, the experience that the individual baby uh, uh, experiences uh, promotes uh, pruning of, in uh, certain uh, brain cells. Um, and in general, the, the uh, example that Dr. Sheldonworth used of the stress, okay, the baby that is raised in a uh, enriched environment, a stimulating environment, is uh, the brain is going to respond to that by literally growing uh, more synapses, as opposed to a baby who is born and raised in a somewhat uh, restricted um, environment, restricted and stimulation environment. So the pruning is driven by experience after birth. So that's why it's very important. Connections used regularly become stronger and more complex. Connections that are not used, right? They, if, if the handshake isn't there, right? Uh, they are pruned away. And uh, new, however, new, new experiences, new connections can also be established and reinforced. It's all about reinforcement of those initial um, connections. And this is the ultimate for the baby. You use it or lose it very much so than in, in other ages. So what also applies to what applies to babies also applies to us, right? Yeah. We all were once who, who was it that said, you know, we Mark Twain said, we all once were children, but most of us have forgotten that. <laughs> yes, indeed. So throughout life, brain development and function is characterized by many new synapses, by more complex uh, connections, and also by uh, faster communication. So what's, so how can we have faster communication? So Dr. Shuttleworth showed us all the neurons, mm -hmm. but what he didn't show us is that there are, if you will, cells that insulate those uh, axons, and it's called myelin, and the myelin allows the impulses to literally to leapfrog down the length of that uh, axon. So it, it is a much faster uh, communication due to the myelin. So the myelination, which is, uh, again, it's a brain process whereby all of the axons become insulated with this, uh, these cells uh, that produce myelin, that continues up until about the mid-30s. 
um, years, that is. <laughs> um, so that process really takes um, quite a long time. Uh, and that's often what we see and what we talk about as maturation. You know, when the teenagers grow up and they might leave home and they start to establish homes of their own, all that is part of this maturation that we see with the myelin creating all these new synapses um, and it really establishing a lot of uh, executive function growth. Um, as we, as mature adults, we benefit from all the, all the mechanisms that babies and children have, uh, have used uh, during their growing years. And again, the rule, use it or lose it, has been applied more to older people, but it, it really can apply, it can apply to everybody and to basically everything that we do, use it or lose it. So here are some tips for uh, optimizing the use it or lose it uh, paradigm. Pursue new experiences or new ways to do old things, equally useful. Keep up the old skills, but let's add variations. You know, maybe we should start brushing our teeth with our left hand or our non-dominant hand, whatever. Um, listening, observing, and reading, that's, those are all wonderful activities, however, Though that tends to be a little more passive, but active is better. So doing, teaching, writing are even better because they're active and we're using more of our brain and more uh, innovation, if you will. Um, we are young only once. After that, we need some other excuse. <laughs> As I, I have a 25-year-old son, my, my son's grown up. And uh, I've always told him, you know, if you're going to make if you're going to make mistakes, make them early, because as you mature, you can say, well, I've learned my lesson, right? So, and remember, uh, this is another good one. There's no there's no fool like an old fool, right? Okay. And our last myth. Oh, okay. I guess it all it's all clinical from here on in. Okay. Whoops. Oh gosh. Okay, I think I lost it here. Hold on. Let me go back. Okay. Myth number four, you can't teach an old dog new tricks or how about Sudoku, crossword puzzles, etc. Well, the question is, can we teach an old dog new tricks? So this is, I don't know if, I, I can't tell the age of a dog by looking at him to tell you the truth. Um, but these are some of the tricks that our dogs so that, the juggling, can anybody juggle in here? I can't juggle, we've got a dog juggling here. <laughs> there you go. So dogs, old dogs can learn new tricks, but it helps if you start young. Right? Start, start as soon as possible, please. Um, so if we're going to learn new things, it's going to take time and tension. Sometimes it takes courage, absolutely. Uh, resolve, persistence, Persistence is a very important quality. In other words, never give up. Keep on doing it. Uh, commitment to your goals. Getting out of your comfort zone. You know, the old, the old saying is like, well, I've always done it this way. And then the comeback is, well, let's try something different. Getting out of your comfort zone. Imagination at all times. It pays to write the goals down doesn't it? It's just like a grocery list, right? It pays to write it down. Uh, that actually eases up, it, it frees up more brain power to do other things if you write it down. You won't have to keep on remembering those, like, oh, I can't remember, I can't, I can't forget, you know, the onions, uh, etc. cetera. Um, so it pays to write the goals down. It also pays to say, I think, in my own experience, it pays to say them out loud to yourself. You know, thinking something is one thing, writing it down, but to actually say it out loud uh, and say it out loud a couple times. And it also, it's even better if, um, if you can say them out loud to other people. I think we call that a commitment <laughs> that I'm going to do this and not just think it and not just say it to ourselves, but say it to our family and our friends. And, and uh, maybe we'll create a new, a new event, if you will. So here are some um, things that actually are useful. This is exercising our brain 
and it's uh, digging into uh, the old words and the old uh, uh, patterns, if you will, the number patterns. So all, all of these things are good. I mean, it's kind of like the doctor. Did, 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 did any doctor ever tell you not to exercise? No. So. <laughs> so old dogs can learn new tricks. There are many new things to experience and to learn every day. Um, how many people have a bucket list here? Okay, excellent. How many people have a written bucket list? Okay, still a number. Okay, so how many have 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 shared the bucket list with other people and, and hope to uh, explore that with them? Again, a few, a few people. This is great. So this is an example. If you you know you think of you write them down, you share them with people, you're more likely to do it actually. Um, so what is a bucket list? Uh, it's, by definition, it's a list of things to do before you die that you would like to do before you die. It comes from the term a kick the bucket, which means to pass on. And believe it or not, this is the bucket list is a relatively new term. You know, it's not been around for 100 years, I can tell you that much from the movies, exactly. And the bucket list is something that you want to do before you kick the bucket. So what we strive for, healthy body and mind, exercise and be physically active always. You know, I, I have to tell you in my clinical work, I've stopped using the term exercise. It has a terribly bad connotation. But being active is a better way to say it. Being physically active uh, really captures, uh, I think, a lot more of um, what we want to do, what we'd like to do. So let's keep on being physically active. Exercise means you have to work at it. Yeah. So I think be, be well, point made, be, fit, be physically active. Um, make at least one New Year's resolution and write it down. That's, that's good, isn't it? Yeah, and uh, tidy up any uh, unresolved uh, personal conflicts. You know, if something is lurking in your past and maybe from time to time you think about that, maybe you should do something about that. That would probably reduce that level of stress perhaps with an individual or, or a situation. But again, I, I put this in under the, if you will, the New Year's resolution. You know, it's like, I'm really, I'm really going to apologize to that eighth grade classmate of mine for what I did to him one time. It's been haunting me all these years. Actually, I think it was more ninth grade, but anyway, it's been haunting me all these years. My high school reunion is coming up in another one year, and I'm, he's, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cross that off my bucket list to apologize to that young man. Okay, so... Again, old dogs performing new tricks, not only just learning new tricks, right? Performing new tricks. Keep up with the good habits and activities that you have carried over from the past. Hopefully that's things like uh, good nutrition, keeping up uh, family uh, and family relationships and friendships, if you will. Um, reminisce with conversation, music, and pictures. You know, that's, that's a good stimulus because number one, those memories are in there. So let's see if we can't activate them and get them back out again. And it's, and it's, it's joyful. It's, it's enjoyable. Um, again, plan deviations, updates, new twists on your old trick. And like I already mentioned, the brushing your teeth with the, with the other hand, but such things as, you know, uh, taking different paths to, to get to the grocery store to kind of change things up a little bit. That, again, gives us all a lot of, of mental flexibility. Uh, eat your vegetables. Again, is that a new versus an old trick? Hopefully that's an old trick, if you will. Uh, keep up or start the weekly crossword puzzles. I've never been good at crossword puzzles. I don't know, maybe I should put it on my bucket list. It's not there right now, but I seemingly don't have the time, but that's, that, that's a great excuse, isn't it? I don't have the time. And maintain a close, meaningful human connections always. Yeah, that's, that's what life is really all about. <clears throat> Personal goals, I have personal goals. Jumping out of a plane with somebody else. <laughs> and I have to tell you, when my son was here two weeks ago uh, to, to uh, do some academic activities down here, he told me he did that. And I about had a cow, <laughs> I can't believe it. But he says, well, no mom, it was okay, it was safe and you know, but I, so if he can do it, I can do that. So that's, that has risen now higher up on my bucket list since he's done it, I need to do that. And again, like using the, the gardening uh, uh, theme here. So does anybody know what this 
gardening technique is called? Uh, espalier. You, you espalier the tree, and it's usually a fruit tree. Uh, this is something that I want to do um, in, in my lifetime. And of course, the problem is you can't do this quickly <laughs> because the tree takes a long time to, to grow. So I'm, I have a place picked out in my house. I'm going to see if I can't plant that tree this, this, uh, this fall and get that started. So th these are my own personal goals. And um, I'm sure I have many more things to put down on my bucket list, but these are the two immediate ones. And now I think it's your turn. <laughs> You've heard us talking. Dr. Shuttleworth, I'm gonna have you come on up to the stage again. So we have about um, eight or 10 minutes for questions. And I'm gonna let you take the first question. Sure. Yes. A question. People who get Alzheimer's or dementia, is there any common factor between them that y'all found? Well, I'll, I'll turn that straight back to you in a minute. There's a small genetic component to Alzheimer's disease. The, the question was, um, with Alzheimer's disease, is there any common causative factor that might underlie Alzheimer's disease? The answer is no, not that we know of yet. There's a small genetic component, just a few percent. But for most of it, it's unexplained uh, to my knowledge, but this is what you work on on a daily basis. Right. So the question, again, uh, so what, uh, what, what is uh, in common with people, uh, amongst people who have Alzheimer's disease? In general, it's age, for the most part. Um, there are uh, some individuals who, um, con who develop the symptoms at a young age, perhaps in their 40s, rare in their 40s, uh, 50s or 60s. But um, that's a, a condition that occurs with age. So that's the, that's the strongest determinant uh, of who is going to get Alzheimer's disease. Somebody comes in complaining in, in their 20s of memory problems, it's, it's not going to be Alzheimer's disease. So there are a, a number of other risk factors involved, but the only determining risk factor, as Dr. Shuttleworth said, is there's a, a, a three different genes they might, they probably will discover other ones, but uh, currently there's only three, there's three genes that will determine if you will get Alzheimer's disease. And it accounts for a very, very small portion of individuals with Alzheimer's disease. In the room. Uh, I have two questions that either one of you can answer. One's technical and one is kind of a general. There are five major, sorry. Go ahead, sir. There's five major neurochemicals in the brain that regulate us. Things like endorphins, um, serotonin, and whatnot. As we age and get older, which of those five or one of those is most suspect to declining when we age? Well, the, no the number one is dopamine. Dopamine drops by about 20%, including the strain of dopamine. So dopamine's involved in a few different things, including uh, reward, but also motor control. So that's part of the, uh, part of the issue of slowing with aging. Um, others all decrease, and, and cholinergic acetylcholine decreases with Alzheimer's disease are well documented uh, with aging, including with Alzheimer's disease. And so some drugs target that, but in general, apart from that, there aren't specific targeting of the neurochemistry of the brain specific to aging. There are specific to di different disorders, but not specific to aging, as far as I'm aware. Second question is, in general, when we do experiments on the brain, I'm curious why scientists choose a particular mammal to do that, with, which is the rat. Why is that? Well, uh, it's changed a lot recently. So 20 years ago, 30 years ago, it was rats, now mostly mice, with a little bit of rat work done in psychology. Mouse is favored because of its ability for genetic manipulation. So a lot of neurodegenerative disorders and Alzheimer's and others have genetic components and you can ma manipulate that more easily and quickly in mice. So we, we, there's a lot of fruit fly work that's done quite to do fast genetics. Mouse is the mammalian model of choice right now and it's mainly because of genetics. In the front. Yeah, I'm just going to ask one question because I think that's fair to the rest of the audience. <laughs> I have read research that says doing Sudoku and crossword are task specific, but don't have any kind of general effect. Is that true? There's mixed, uh, you might have commented on this too, but, but I think there's mixed data on that. So yes, at one level. So the question is task specificity. So if you practice something very well, you might be very, very good at Sudoku, but that might not translate to anything else in your life. 
that's not 100% true. So, so the folks doing cognitive rehab for uh, brain disorders and other things find transference of some of those activities. But I, I would, so that's very specific depending on what the disorder is and what the tests are. But my hunch would have been the same as yours. I don't think it's good to practice one thing, like just running on a treadmill is not as good as walking around and being in a complex world. And so I would agree with your general point, but I would hedge a little bit and say that there is um, benefits seen more generally than just the one specific task, but it's not a panacea. You can't do Sudoku and be good at everything else. That does not work, but, it, but there is some transference. I can I can tell you from my clinical experience. One of the tests that we uh, that I do in um, my cognitive disorder clinic is I ask people to give me uh, certain uh, words, like words that start with a certain letter, and I can tell the people who do the crossword puzzles <laughs> because they are. I mean, I can't write them down as quickly as they as they tell me, and so at the end I say. Do you do crossword puzzles? So yeah, I do. I do. Yeah, I do a crossword puzzle every day. So I mean, it does help in facilitating pulling up certain words. So in that respect, yes. But it doesn't necessarily generalize to other uh, other abilities. Thank you. What in the very back? What, what's the purpose of sleep for the brain? Uh, it's a great question. So uh, the, the, what is the purpose of sleep in the brain? This is an extraordinarily important topic that we're just learning about right now in basic neuroscience. Yeah. Sleep is essential for life because it's essential for the brain. So you need sleep uh, to do a few things. One is to uh, clear out the metabolic waste products of these little machines that are working all the time. So if you don't sleep, you actually get a buildup of uh, metabolic products that, uh, that decrease the efficiency of brain function. So one is waste management. And so when you're sleeping, it's actually pumping out this stuff from your brain. Another piece of it is actually encoding information. So when we're conscious, we're actually dealing with a large amount of information. We're not laying much stuff down. That happens when we sleep. So when you, if you try and learn a new task, when you're sleeping in, 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 a, in a stage of sleep, you have different stages of sleep, but one of those stages is slow wave sleep. During that stage, stuff that was published just last year in mouse studies shows that that activity is being replayed by the mouse and causes those connections to be, stabil to be stabilized. So you're actually locking that in. So if you take away the ability to sleep after learning, they do the trial, they try to learn something, they don't get very good at it. Sleeping lays down that information. So if you don't sleep, um, Firstly, you'll die. So it's absolutely essential for life and it's essential for the brain to be healthy and to work. So we're actually going to approach this topic next uh, March for Brain Awareness Week. We have an event at the Albuquerque Academy and our aim is to focus it on sleep, uh, talking about the basic science, but also what that means for uh, clinical medicine and healthy living. Will that be open to the public? Yes. So that's uh, Albuquerque Academy, Tuesday the 13th of March. So I, I have one, uh, one additional point about that. So not only have they done that study in animals, they've actually done it in college students mm -hmm. about learning and then going to sleep or not going to sleep. So uh, staying up all night to cram for a study, to, to cram for a test is actually less efficient than studying intensive, intensively and then sleeping. You can recall it better uh, that next morning if you've had sleep rather than stay up all night studying it. So it's, it's, it's applicable to humans as well. Yes. <laughs> Are there gender differences in aging habits? I, I'm not sure, I don't, I know there's literature on this, but unfortunately I don't know that literature well. There's differences in, the, the questions is gender differences, male versus female in aging, what? In generally in aging? Uh, Generally, in aging, and uh, well, in the whole gamut, uh, physical, cognitive, uh, memory. Can I ask you yes. a little bit? Yes. So, so my answer is that women age more gracefully than men. That is slightly different answer. Right? <laughs> Next question. Uh, there, there is a lot of literature on this topic, and so there's differences in in the amount of 
brain loss, that what needs to be factored out is differences in longevity. And so the data is a little bit, it's not black and white, but there are in, uh, in early, there's more data on uh, hormonal fluctuations and how that changes cognitive function in uh, women at an earlier age, but in, in uh, the differences. So if you, if you look at studies between very young and very old, you can see very clear differences. We don't have really good data on sex differences in the aged population, but I would, be, I would bet there are some. Yeah, and that's partly because all of the other uh, conditions of life affect us as we age. So such things as uh, cardiac problems and smoking and high cholesterol, exercise, diet. So there are a lot more variables uh, to, to studying older people than there are studying younger people and, and gender differences just based upon differences just based upon gender. Many questions, one here, then here. So um, we've talked about making new connections, and um, so that means that the neurons that we have are capable of making new connections and discarding old ones that are not important, like pruning. But we still can't make new neurons yet. We can. We can. So that's another myth. Another myth was that you had zero new neurons after birth okay. or soon after birth. Um, there are some areas of the brain that do have um, neurogenesis is the official word for this, the genesis of new neurons. Um, this was discovered probably 20 years ago now, that the human brain does this in a couple of places. One is the hippocampus. It's, a, it's an area of the brain involved in the memory storage and formation. Um, a classic example of this was a well-publicized study of um, cabbies uh, in London, people that drive the taxis in London. And they had to learn these complex maps, and there was an increase in neurogenesis, an increase in size, mixing two studies, but there was an increase in size on the hippocampus, and the hippocampus is one of the places where you can grow new neurons and they get integrated into that. that. There's a little bit of evidence for new neurons coming in in response to injury. So if you have a stroke or trauma, there are cells that are resident that, that are lurking around in different parts of your brain that get recruited to the injury site and are brand new. We know that from animal studies, and it's probably true for humans. But in everyday life, you don't have this constant stream of neurons coming and growing uh, back up. It's more like the, the well-established orchard where the trees have been there for 100 years and they might look a bit different as they've been pruned, but it's basically the same trees. But the old neuron, my normal neurons can give me connections. Absolutely, okay. that's, that's it. So, okay. so that you can continue to prune and change and, and change how they connect to others throughout life. Right. I, yeah, I would put my money on the white matter, making all those connections than in actually growing uh, new neurons. Right. Yeah. Is your brain on recall when you dream? Is your brain on recall when you dream? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's a very interesting question. I don't know the answer to that, but I will tell you that there's a lot of processing that's happening during sleep. And some of that we just mentioned was to lay down new memories, but that gets integrated with everything that's already in there. So there is a lot of recall of past experience that's incorporated into the processing of new information. And that's how things stick. Things stick when you learn them by integrating with what's already there. And so I would bet, although I don't know for sure, I would bet there's a lot of active recall of past memories in order to integrate new information during sleep. And if you get woken up, um, maybe you'll be surprised by something that you hadn't thought about for a long time that might be incorporated in some of that. So it's a good point. Uh, in the yellow. Yes. 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 I just wanted to tell you that when my um, one of my cousins was almost ninety, on her bucket list for years, had been jumping in plane. <laughs> she was almost ninety, and she said, "Well, I'm going to do it." Thank you. That's well, such a wonderful encouragement. <laughs> So I think maybe on that note, on that note we need to wrap up. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you so much.